Hello and welcome to the A201 General Conditions Administering the Contract for Construction webinar, brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. This webinar is part one in a two-part series on the A201. A few administrative items before we get started. Just as a reminder, please make sure you have a copy of the A201 for reference during the presentation. This presentation is protected by US and international copyright law, so reproduction distribution display without written permission is prohibited. This program is also registered with the AIA. This course, part one, as well as part two, uh, is eligible for a combined three HSW learning units. You um, will receive the three learning units after you attend part two. Disclaimer, this program and all uh, programs brought to you by AIA contract documents are not provided as legal advice. So this information um, cannot be used for mediation, arbitration, or litigation purposes. We always recommend that you uh, contact your legal counsel. So again, nothing in this program is provided as legal advice. With that, I'm gonna now turn it over to one of our presenters, Arlen Solacek, to go ahead and introduce the panel. Arlen, take it away. Thank you, Hasti, and good afternoon to everybody. We're really happy to have everybody join us today. Um, here's the speakers for our webinars on this slide and the next one. Um, I calculated that between us, we have about 150 years of combined practice experience. Kevin, Roger, and Forrest come from traditional architectural practice. While I'm an architect who spent nearly all of my career working in-house for owners, both for private, corporate, and public higher ed institutions. Next. All four of us have been part of the AI Documents Committee, the group of 25 to 30 volunteer AI members from a variety of backgrounds and from all over the country. That committee is responsible for writing or updating all of AI's standard agreements and forms. Between us, we served nearly 50 years on the committee. The genesis for this presentation started with conversations that Kevin had with the younger practitioners in his office. Roger and Forrest had similar discussions within their firms. I worked for 30 years trying to guide project teams through the snarl of major construction programs, all with their share of challenges. The commonality is that each of us has a passion about passing along our knowledge and experience and practice, how to do it well, how to stay out of trouble, and just as important, where to look and what to do when trouble finds you. Next. Here and on the next slide are some of the learning objectives which you've already read. Today we'll be covering the first half of the general conditions document, which we like to call the setup and the roster of players. Part two will be on December 9th when we'll cover the second half of the general conditions, something we like to call the game. Next. Each day we'll discuss the roles, responsibilities, and relationships and risk assignments between the owner, architect, and contractor as they are linked through a single document, the A201 General Conditions. We'll provide an overview of the A201 document, including the basic and essential information that architects should understand in order to successfully lead and administer a project during construction, as well as meeting the requirements for the health, safety, and welfare of project constituents and the general public. Next. Before we dive into the general conditions, I'd like to talk real quickly about the AI documents in general. Next. The contract documents program has a longstanding history. AI has been publishing standard form documents since 1888, 132 years ago. The reason AI created these standard documents was to make design and construction transactions more predictable and consistent. AI currently offers nearly 200 agreements and forms. What makes the AIA documents the industry standard, besides their widespread use, is the volume of case history and precedent incorporated in these documents. They are written to be fair and balanced, to represent each party's interests equally. 
But just as important is that the agreements allocate risks to the party best able to manage and control that risk. Each group listed in the last bullet point plays an important role in the development of documents. Market research is done early to validate issues and identify topics that are important to the industry. And this helps the documents committee prioritize areas where change is needed or provide guidance on new initiatives such as sustainability or digital documents. With each revision, the design, construction, and legal professions evaluate new or revised language to reflect best practices for the industry. Next. So what are the general conditions? General conditions are part of the contract documents that we'll discuss in a moment. It's not a document that architects need to memorize, but architects should be familiar with and reference it when an issue arises. The general conditions were first released in 1911 and was only 11 pages long. Today, the general conditions has grown to 37 pages, single spaced with more than 25,000 words. It's dense, it's detailed, and it's not just because we like to write contracts or can't be concise in what we write. Every sentence in the A201 is in there for a reason. And what we'll do today, and in part two, is give you a big picture of the A201, provide some detail about a few nuanced items, and then pass along decades of experience and knowledge through some stories and very hard earned battle scars. Next. Let's first look at the relationship between the project's parties and how the general conditions ties into the other agreements for a project. You're already familiar with traditional design, bid, build, project delivery, which AI calls conventional delivery, where the owner selects the architect first to the design the project and produce construction documents. The owner then solicits bids to select the contractor and issues a contract based upon a fixed stipulated contract amount. The A201, that gray rectangle in the middle of the slide, provides the general conditions that define and coordinate the roles, responsibilities, relationships, and risk allocation between the owner, architect, and contractor. Taken together, these form the role, rules of engagement for the project. And you're going to hear a lot about those four or five R words today. We've shown the primary agreement numbers between the parties, as well as showing the full names of those documents in that really small print at the bottom of the slide. Construction manager is constructor, which you also may know as CMC, CM at risk, or CMAR, uses the same A01 general conditions for its construction phase. The A201 also is the basis for general conditions that are used in the shorter agreements for small projects, like the A104 and A105, as well as for the other delivery methods, including construction manager, advisor, and design build. Even custom written general conditions that you might say, that you might see also, let's charitably say borrow, significantly from the A201 concepts and language, but often shift responsibilities or risks between the parties. Next. You just saw a whole bunch of document numbers on the last slide. The numbering probably looks like it has no logic, but there's actually a system behind it. Let's look at it really quickly. AI agreements and forms use an alphanumeric system to designate each document. For the A201 that we'll talk about today, the A makes it part of the owner contractor set of documents. Next. The two is the type of document, here a conditions or scope document. Next. Next, the zero makes it part of the conventional or traditional bid delivery family. Next. The last digit is a one because if we discussed, the A201 is the granddaddy, the first in the set of conditions. The 2017 is the issue date. This A201 that we'll talk about today was released as part of the 10 year review cycle of updates for the entire conventional family of agreements, forms, and exhibits. Last, the full document name, AI Document 201 2017, General Conditions of the Contract for Construction, is way too long to keep saying, and it's a tongue tire, so we're just going to refer to it as the A201 general conditions, or just GCs. Next. 
Let's start with some broad concepts that form the basis of the general conditions. Next slide. As a note, you'll always be able to know where we are in the general conditions from that reference shown just beneath the title of the slide. So what's in the general conditions and more, why do you even care? To give you an idea of how important it is for architects to get to know the general conditions, the word architect is used over 300 times in the A201. This is the only AI document where significant details regarding the architect's responsibilities are spelled out in a document that the architect isn't a party to. Remember that the A201 is a set of conditions between the owner and the contractor. The B101, the Common Owner Architect Agreement, contains information about the architect's construction phase services. But the architect also agrees to provide contract administration as further described in the A201, and there's a lot more there as you're going to see. The architect's responsibilities are consistent between the documents through parallel language found in each one, such as you see here in the slide. But what happens if the owner and the contractor decide on their own to modify the architect's responsibilities in the A201? Next. According to the owner-architect agreement, no modification will affect the architect's services unless the owner also changes its agreement with the architect. This is also why if the owner isn't using the A201 as the project's general conditions, it's very important for you to read and reconcile the architect's services between the owner-architect agreement and the alternate construction conditions that are being used. Next. Kevin's going to discuss some more of the importance of the general conditions and what documents form the contract. Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Arlen. Good day, all. Um, underlying everything we're talking about uh, both today and uh, in a few weeks uh, uh, is the notion of standard of care, which is a phrase I hope uh, we have all heard. Uh, it is a meaningful phrase in protecting yourself and your firm from claims of negligence. Uh, and on a happier note, it is a meaning, it's meaningful in understanding how to meet the obligations of your contract without wasting your own time and money doing stuff that isn't your job. Go ahead with the next one. Um, <clears throat> A201. A well, let me let me let me back up a second. AIA started adding uh, standard of care language to owner architect agreements relatively recently. I think in 2007, if I recall correctly, uh, in an effort to stem the tide uh, of so-called standards uh, that were drafted into uh, agreements or added into AIA agreements that that really created a contractual liability, and therefore would not be covered by uh, our collective. Uh, pro professional liability insurances. Uh, but all that's a topic for another day. Um, A201 becomes the standard of care in a professional liability suit, uh, quite often whether it's a part of the contract or not, because of its prevalence of use in the industry. Next. Let's talk for a second about another important characteristic of AIA documents, uh, uh, and that is um, the coordination aspect uh, of uh, documents. That is the roles, responsibilities, relationships, risk allocation, rules of engagement, these five R's that you're going to hear us talking about uh, throughout the course of these presentations uh, are uh, coordinated amongst all of the agreements. They all work together to create no gaps, no overlaps. They are consistent across all the agreements and forms. Um, and in my experience, uh, reviewing uh, countless at this point of my career, uh, ag agreements generated both from AIA forms, manuscript, attorney, owner's attorneys, it's rarely true of the documents that come from other sources. And so you you create uh, ambiguities, inconsistencies, uh, and even uh, conflict uh, in terms of what might be included in, in all of the agreements. I've seen owner-drafted general conditions where uh, the architect, uh, has it says, will visit the site two or three times a month. 
uh, but the own, the architect's agreement doesn't reflect similar language. And it's really important, as you can see from that example, why you would want all those things to be coordinated. So what does that coordination look like in action? Um, the owner architect ag agreement first says very, very little about CA services uh, and assumes and actually references the A201 as a baseline for those services. So A uh, B101, uh, and we use this alphabet soup um, just uh, very, very easily. Sorry about that. Uh, B101 standard owner architect agreement that we all often use. Um, is very limited in terms of the scope of what we're going to do during CA. That is further amplified in A201, as Arlen indicated. And on this slide, we show some of the architect services and responsibilities in B101 uh, in comparison to the A201 general conditions, the paragraphs that enumerate similar or expand upon uh, those responsibilities. There is a lot of parallel language, but the A201 cons contains a considerable number of additional requirements for the architect. And they're defined in A201 because it's important to the contractor to understand the state of play, how the architect is going to behave on the project. So in other words, if all you read is your B101, you may not actually have the entire story. And a prudent architect needs to be on guard for which general conditions are used on a project, particularly if the owner is using another set or it's a custom written set of general conditions. Uh, and this happens all the time with our software. People can download uh, their own version of the uh, A201 and uh, modify it any way they see fit. Uh, but uh, you have to know what those changes are in order to do your job well. The architect's got to do that comparison, see if there are any differences. Uh, and often uh, these changes occur uh, in turnaround times for RFIs or shop drawings and the like. Uh, but it can be even more dangerous than that. Um, uh, again, in terms of uh, visits to the site, responsibilities well on site. So it becomes very important uh, that you pay attention uh, and check these things through before you undertake construction administration. Um, uh, services. Okay, uh, we're slowly uh, but surely honing in our target now. Uh, to understand A201 and to effectively use it, we have to understand its context. A201 is one part of the construction contract. So let's go back to basics. Uh, first of all, what constitutes a contract? Um, the attorneys have a very uh, concise definition for this, but in layman's terms, uh, you've got to have an enumeration of the parties. Uh, you've got to have a price. You have to have a period of performance and a scope of work uh, that is going to uh, be executed uh, between the parties for the price during the period of performance. And in our world, uh, what that uh, equates to uh, is uh, the owner and the constructor of the parties. Uh, the owner and the architect are in a separate agreement. And you might have heard the notion of privity of contract. The architect is not a part of the construction contract. They are not, they don't have privity to that agreement, uh, but they are, uh, they are interested in it. And as we said, they have certain responsibilities that are defined by it. Uh, subcontractors as well fit into this. And if the owner has other uh, contractors uh, direct to the owner, they would fall outside of uh, being in the contract we're talking about here. The what is our project, the thing we want them to build. How much is the bid amount, the negotiated uh, fee, the guaranteed maximum price, whatever the, whatever the construct is uh, for arriving at a cost. And the time is the substantial completion date or potentially other milestones specific to a project. It's also sometimes uh, defined the elapsed time uh, between substantial and final completion can be included. But generally speaking, what we're aiming at here is substantial completion. OK, simple enough. What does that look like? 
most days i think we all as architects focus on the construction documents piece of this the drawings and specifications uh, and a term and that term is often mistakenly used interchangeably with contract documents they're two very different animals the project scope is defined initially by the construction documents and if you look at your b101 you'll see that language is our deliverable uh, at the end of the construction documents phase. And they include, as I said, the drawings and the technical specifications. Uh, many of us call that a project manual. Other things get found in there, as you are probably aware. Um, the definition uh, in um, uh, A201 uh, contained in Article 1.1.6 is that portion of the con for, for the project manuals, that portion of the con contract documents consisting of written requirements uh, for materials, uh, systems, standards, and workmanship for the work. Uh, parenthetically, by the way, the building information model, the BIM, uh, is neither a construction document nor a contract document. Uh, and if we wanted to spend three or four days talking about that subject, we might have time. But for the time being, that we've not crossed that bridge yet. Uh, now, the initial contract documents include the agreement between the owner and the contractor. Uh, in, in our illustration here, we have the A101, uh, which is the agreement used for a project with a stipulated sum or bid. Um, there are other types of co owner contractor agreements we'll mention later. And the AIA has a number of different forms of agreement depending on the delivery and pricing arrangement covered by A101, 102, 103, 104, 105. Uh, once you get out of the 101, 102, 103 into the 104 and 105, the later uh, uh, versions are for unique uh, project conditions, smaller projects, uh, and they include their own a uh, un uh, unique but based on A201 reduced set of general conditions all wrapped up in a single document um, for ease of use. A101 is a fill in the blank kind of a document. Um, uh, it, it, what, we, what, what is intended there is that the things that are unique to the project uh, are changed in the A101, but the A201 is a separate piece that is fundamentally not intended to change. Although, as I've mentioned before, it's easy to modify and can be changed in little ways to uh, adjust to certain conditions of projects. The general for, for the conditions, the general conditions for the construction, uh, we show the AIA A201 uh, is the next piece. Then there are addenda, which occur during the bidding or pricing phase of the project. And occasionally you'll run across other documents and exhibits that become part of the contract documents uh, by inclusion, uh, by reference, as we say, in the agreement. Um, so uh, what we want to impress upon you is that the contract documents include a lot more than just the contract, um, that agreement piece. Um, and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot more than we normally think about in terms of the construction documents that we deliver as a part of our agreement. Um, last but not least uh, uh, are uh, the, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, as the, so next slide, oh, we're in the project progresses, very good. Once the project is underway, the contract also will include any modifications agreed to during the course of the construction, including uh, changes that affect compensation uh, and or schedule. Uh, and those take the form of change orders, CCDs, uh, or construction change directives, changes that clarify scope only, uh, for example, ASIs, uh, or uh, any other contract amendments that both parties agree to and sign, which can be and quite often is about anything in the world. It seems like acronyms are, are made up on each project based on what contractors like to call them, but fundamentally they hunt back to issues of scope and time or things that just change uh, scope and time and compensation or things that just change the scope without affecting time and compensation. 
Okay, so uh, the key takeaways, construction documents uh, do not equal contract documents. Uh, the drawings and the tech specs are the contract doc are, are a part of contract documents. Uh, uh, they describe the what uh, or the project scope and are enumerated in the agreement between the owner and the architect. You list them actually in uh, A101 and its ilk. Uh, what aren't con contract documents? Um, <clears throat> instructions to bidders or other bid information, including the contractor's bid, unless specifically noted or included in the agreement, uh, are never included in the contract documents unless, again, you decide to do that. Submittals are not a part of the contract documents, shop drawings and the like, and RFIs uh, are not uh, part of the contract documents. Okay, we're good, right? That's everything we need. No, we need one of those R's uh, that we've been talking about, the rules of the game and thus the general conditions. All right, thanks, Kevin. As this little guy has come to realize, construction is a complicated endeavor. And there are a lot of what ifs that have to be anticipated during the course of the project and a plan for dealing with them established. These what ifs, and these changes um, are the primary purpose of A201. It sets out the rules and processes for dealing with things that change. So what if expected conditions change? The site is not exactly as we thought it would be. What if the project is delayed? Well, read the general conditions and the contract, and we'll try to help you know where to find answers to those things. And the construction projects almost always contain a number of what ifs that may cause uncertainty and or delay or expense down the road. A good agreement and set of conditions tries to address most of the known what ifs and list the must do obligations of each of these parties and allocate the risk, those R's again. So I like to think of it this way. There is what we know the contract documents, uh, the construction documents, portion of the contract documents, notably the plans and specs, tell us this, what we know. There is what we know we don't know. Submittals, we haven't seen those yet. Schedule float time, what might that uh, be? Allowances, unit prices, contingencies. These are all tools for dealing with uncertainty that we are anticipating. And then lastly, there's what we don't know that we don't know. And RFIs, change orders, and claims are examples of this, and that's where the general conditions come into play to guide us through a process for dealing with that. Next. So, um, Kevin talked about the context, and we kind of understand that. So, what is in the A201? It's got all these R's. And, and we read those a number of times, but uh, the architect's role is to administer the agreement, but you can't administer what you don't know or you don't understand. So what do the conditions say? What does the agreement say? And one of the important concepts that is a driver in the development of these agreements and in their editing on a 10 year cycle is to keep the work moving. And why is there so much emphasis placed on keeping the work moving? Because it costs a lot to all the parties if the project comes to a halt or is delayed, and those costs typically far outweigh the cost of the issue that's at play. So it's set up to prevent anybody from being able to hold the project hostage over a disputed item because time is money. The A201 sets up a number of time limits and processes in order to keep the project moving as it encounters changes, problems, conflicts. You'll see these in written notice provisions, um, construction change directives that tell the contractor to keep going even while we figure out the price, hidden conditions processes, and then importantly, the contractor has a contractual obligation to diligently perform the work even while claims are in progress, again, because the cost of stopping to resolve the claim 
would be too great on all the parties. All right, so some basic navigation. We've got a lot of information in the A201. Arlen told you how many pages and words it was. I can never remember that. So how do we navigate our way to the right answers? So here's a, a look at the first part of that 1911 first edition of the AIA General Conditions. It's kept in a super secret spot in the AIA archives in DC. If you could read this print, you'd see that many of the section titles and paragraph names and even the general arrangement of the content continue all the way through today's version. This history provides a long time and court tested content even as the document has grown longer and more complex in response to construction pretty much doing the same thing. The first eight pages of the current A201 is a table of contents and an index located in the front. The index is placed at the beginning of the document to help us find things. AIA did that to help us all out. And AI, A201 is the only document where the documents committee provides such help. Well, it's a good idea, at least occasionally, and maybe after this seminar you will, few people read the general conditions from beginning to end. But using these tools as an example, if you're seeking to understand the architect's role, table of contents will direct you to Article 4. But if you're really curious about waivers of subrogation, the index will help you find Article 6.1.1 and 11.3. See? It's easy. All right, and uh, this is the table of articles as they currently exist. As we go through this content today, look for those themes of keeping the work going, though that theme of allocating risk to the party best able to manage it, and, and what each party's role is. Um, this table of contents has not changed much over the last iterations on these 10-year cycles. Um, and as, as we said, the, the A201 is over 100 years old, almost 110. So that's 100 years of looking for things in the same place. You'd think we'd have less trouble finding it by now. So let's get going. You can see the portions of these articles that are the setup and the players, and then 7 through 15, the game, will be in the December seminar. This diagram shows the relationship between the general conditions and other documents in the, in the contracts, in this case, supplemental general conditions and division one specifications. And the concept that this is trying to illustrate is as you move from left to right, you also increase in higher levels of detail. So I wanna just take one example and try to explore that and we'll take shop drawings. The A201 general conditions provides definitions and describes overall responsibilities for shop drawing uh, submission and review. The supplemental general conditions uh, are a place where you can provide information that is more project specific, maybe the turnaround time. Division one of the specifications is the place where very detailed information that's applicable to all or most of the submittals, such as submission format, whether you can use electronic copies, what are the distribution requirements, and what are the review procedures. And then not illustrated on there are the technical specifications, and that's where you get to say those things that are unique to the particular technical specification section. And there's a prime directive in contract documents, and you've probably heard it related to drawings as well, and that is to say it once, say it right, and then don't say it again. And the uh, A201 supports this in, in um, Article 1.2.1. It says that contract documents are complementary. That's good. We've talked about that. And what is required by one shall be as binding as if required by all. So that supports the say it once notion. There is no order of preference. But as you've been warned before, if there are custom documents that don't rely on these same uh, themes like the AIA documents do, you need to, to take care. So some key takeaways. Master spec is coordinated with A201. And if your project doesn't use A201, like 
some of Kevin's projects in the state of Utah, you have to coordinate with whatever form the project uses. There's a tool out there that I, I'm a big fan of called the Uniform Location of Subject Matter. Um, it's been around since 1977. It's a joint effort of AIA, the Engineering Council, and CSI, and it tells you the best place or standardized place to locate all of this information. So what happens if you don't stay coordinated and you don't have your technical specifications refer to the division one submission requirements, et cetera. Um, one owner negotiated a two year correction period and had that in his general conditions, but the consultant in their technical specification made reference to only a one year technical or one year period of correction. So they said it differently and you have an oops. So maybe Kevin can straighten us out. Okay, let's, uh, I think we set enough at the table. Uh, let's dive into article one, uh, which contains a lot of table setting provisions uh, and language that is meaningful across the entire project. Um, next slide. First amongst these is uh, um, the notion of capitalization. It, the really important terms uh, as when it comes to contracts uh, for construction are defined in A201. And you know they're important and you actually know they're defined because they are capitalized. Uh, terms found in many other AIA agreements and forms refer back to and are defined in A201. Um, two really important terms uh, herein defined are contract sum and contract time. Even though those are set forth in the agreement, uh, these terms occur throughout the general conditions and are really the critical pieces of performance under contract for construction. So there's a reason why uh, they're in A201 in, A in Article 1.3, why they're capitalized and defined, and so we'll all understand what we mean by contract sum and contract time. That being said, not every defined term is found in Article 1. Uh, I, I beg you don't ask me why, and also don't ask me why Article 1 terms are not in alphabetical order. I'm told it's a concept called rule in favor of perpetuity, which boiled down means because that's just the way it is. So let's look at an example of capitalization in action. Um, here's a great one. Uh, in, uh, in defining a change order in, a, in Article 7 of the 201, um, you can see uh, a number of capitalized terms uh, 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 that we know will be defined somewhere in the A201 and how they tie uh, internally within the general conditions. First, a change order is being defined here in Article 7, not in Article 1, using the capitalized terms. Uh, and, and that's because it makes sense uh, to define the thing where you find it, um, uh, not, um, not necessarily at the beginning of the agreement. You find it where you're looking for it. Uh, in this case, the capital A architect has a role. Next slide, oh, there we got it. Uh, as does the capital O owner, who is defined in Article 2, as it turns out. And the contractor, next slide, owner, next slide. And the contractor, which is actually defined in Article 3. Uh, and the work, which is actually defined in, in definitions in Article 1, hallelujah. Uh, and finally, those two important concepts, contract sum, and contract time. As I said, there's a method to this madness. Uh, as Forrest discussed a few mi minutes ago, put the information where it is most likely to be discovered. And so that's why uh, the definitions sort of find their way through the agreement. But once you understand the convention, you can begin to understand where to look uh, to find what you, what you need in the situation. Uh, Okay, next up uh, is concept of instruments of service. As we all know, or uh, at least have been told, instruments of service are representations in, in any medium of expression 
now known or later developed of the tangible and intangible creative work performed by the architect and the architect's consultants under their respective professional service agreements. Instruments of service may include without limitations, studies, surveys, models, sketches, drawings, specifications, and other similar materials, which is basically all the stuff you do in the development of the design, development and uh, documentation of your design. Uh, and okay, but why do we care? Really, there are two reasons. One is the ownership of the design, the copyright question um, that is central to our to the creative creative work that we do. And second is avoiding any possibility that our design documents can be construed as a product. Why? Because as scary as architectural practice can be, product liability is by all accounts much worse. And so we never want to think of our our documents as a product. They are an instrument of our service. Um, Oh, yeah, one of these phrases like standard of care. Um, so what's important to understand is, is that we own our process and the client ultimately owns the product, the building that is built. But the drawings, the sketches, the models, all those things that were enumerated in that definition are a part of the process of delivering the service uh, and not a product unto themselves. Next up in Article 1 is a very important concept uh, that we call notice. Um, in Article 1.6, notice is, is defined. Uh, it's a, a formal notification uh, for the really important stuff, uh, which uh, I think in 2007 was, or 17 was required to be in writing. That's because if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And we gotta doc make sure we document and distribute uh, those uh, communications. Failure to strictly comply with the notices requirements more often than not results in the loss of rights, actions, or recovery. And so this becomes a really important issue. Uh, different circumstances may require different means of providing notice. And you can see that um, in the slide, the middle example, where notice is required um, uh, it must be provided in writing to the designated representative. And in 15.1.3, under claims, you have to have proof of delivery. And that is a critical aspect of uh, noticing a claim. Uh, and so it dictates the way that you can deliver notice. But it begs the question, what is writing? Uh, and that will be established uh, through digital data protocols in this day and age. Uh, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, and you should follow whatever rules you establish. But I will say, when in doubt, a good old-fashioned letter always works. So while you might debate whether or not an email uh, comprises notice, uh, a, a letter sent registered through the United States Postal Service cannot be denied. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a number of tolling provisions uh, in uh, the contract and notice is a trigger for either starting a clock where a contractor owner must do something within certain days of notice or stopping a clock by setting a time limit. And so it, um, it just absolutely is critical. Um, I think you got ahead of me, Fosti, uh, a couple of slides. Um, last but certainly not least, data use and transmission of data in digital form, uh, or as I like to ask, how did we ever get projects built with three technical pens, some Mylar, and a landline telephone? Uh, A201 in Articles 1.7 and 1.8 uh, addresses um, uh, the issues of digital data use and reliance uh, for all digital data on the project, not just the BIM, not just your CAD, but how we communicate uh, uh, Conversa decisions, conversations, answers to questions, all of that stuff can be defined uh, uh, or should be defined through digital data protocols. Um, the use of an exchange of such in information has become commonplace in these projects. Previously, the, AI, the A201 stated that if the parties intend to transmit 
they would endeavor to establish protocols, but were not required to do so. And this clearly needed to be changed in an era of uh, email, text messages, chat windows, and all the kinds of things that we are faced with in digital communication today on our projects. So um, these sections, 1.7 and 1.8, require the development of protocols for the transmission of instruments of service or other digital data. And uh, in A101, I believe we require the use of the AIA document E203, the Building Information Modeling and Digital Data Exhibit uh, as a requirement, unless the parties agree to use other protocols or exhibits. Um, E203 is a, is a um, I think, a, a scary looking document, but a very practical um, uh, and easy to use document once you dive into it. And it is intended that, that you complete an E203 uh, when you are executing your owner architect agreement, that you establish the rules for digital communication with the owner before anybody else joins the party. Um, we could disappear down an hour long rabbit hole uh, into the details of E203, but we're not gonna do that today. But I wanna impress a couple of things on you, uh, uh, maybe to take away some of the mystery about E203. First, it's just not as daunting as it seems. When you actually sit down and read through it, you'll discover it's a pretty simple little document, just a lot of fill points. It is scalable to both the project's complexity uh, and the number of participants. Uh, so, you know, it, it, the, one of the, I think the challenges is, is that it, we had to write it so that it worked on one of Ireland's multi-building campus-wide projects, but also for somebody's uh, small commercial building type, type of a project. And the third thing is I would encourage you to pre-fill it to your practices standard and present it to your clients with your agreement from the outset. This is how we normally work. And it allows you to negotiate uh, any changes from your standard uh, into your fee. Harlan. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and you forgot that first digital data machine, the fax machine, when you were talking about how we ever did it way back in the good old days. Um, so you let's know, get into Harlan, we had a We had a thermal fax when I started practicing, and all of those are now blank sheets of paper in our files. <laughs> good. All right, so let's get into the, the different parties. Again, looking at how those important R words, roles, responsibilities, relationships, and risk assignments are then defined in articles two through six. So we like to call this section the roster of players. Next. You know, of course, since I worked on the owner side for most of my career, I drew article two, the owner. One of the basic lessons that we'll discuss through the webinar is that with the architect's responsibility to administer the construction contract between the owner and the contractor, architects have a lot of power. But you need to stay in your lane, you need to be careful using your power, and equally you need to know when not to use it. Next. So what are the owner's primary responsibilities? Basically, we provide project information, we make decisions, and we provide financing. We don't draw, and we don't construct. Prior to starting any construction, and remember that the A201 doesn't come into effect until we sign the construction agreement, we have to designate a representative who can make binding decisions on behalf of the owner. In Article 4, you'll see the general conditions state that the architect will be the owner's representative during construction, but that the architect does not have the authority to bind the owner unless it's specifically stated in the general conditions. So the architect's powers are very limited. Because contractors like to make sure that they'll get paid, owners need to provide evidence of adequate financing before the contractor starts the work. And then once the work begins, the contractor can request additional or updated financial information, but only for a limited number of circumstances. In paragraph 2.3.1, we have to make or we have to provide or make provisions for approvals, easements, and so forth related to the project's initial development and make sure those are obtained. But the contractor is going to be responsible for obtaining other types of permits, such as the building permit. Next. 
Even though construction documents have already been issued for pricing, the general conditions officially require me as the owner to retain any design professionals, including the architect and her consultants, or other direct-to-owner consultants, such as a civil engineer or landscape architect. Because the project site is mine, the owner is also responsible for providing the original site survey, legal description, and other owner-originated information. Last, through the architect, the owner really becomes responsible for providing the documents used to construct the project. But this also establishes the owner's legal liability for the sufficiency of the construction documents. The contractor is entitled to rely on the accuracy and completeness of all owner-provided information, including the construction documents used to construct the project. And this, along with the architect's standard of care, all gets wrapped up in what we know as the Spearin Doctrine, something that's going to be an ongoing presence in your professional lives. Next. As we noted earlier, a primary objective of the general conditions is to keep work going while problems or disputes are being resolved. But there are a few situations that allow either the contractor or the owner to stop the work when resolution can't be reached. The owner's rights to stop or assume the work are good examples of an owner power and leverage. But again, remember, it is never, never, never the architect's right to stop the work at any point, at any time, or for any reason. That is solely the owner's responsibility. And architects, again, need to know the difference between the actions you take and those that are reserved for an owner. Next. Stopping work and more drastic, taking over the contractor's work is really serious and everything possible needs to be done to present it, prevent it. As Kevin told his folks, we're now entering nuclear war territory. Here, as elsewhere in the general conditions, when drastic steps are required, you're going to see an escalating series of actions, required notices, time frames, and in some cases, multiple opportunities for the non-performing party to correct the problem. But if things get as far as the owner taking over portions of the work, this effectively creates a contractor's default to their obligations, and a lot of times it's a symptom of much larger problems. So we'll go back to Kevin now to discuss what the general conditions have to say about the contractor's roles and responsibilities. Take it away, Kevin. If Arlen drew the owner's straw, because that's uh, what he served in his career, I did not similarly draw the contractor role. Um, uh, but here we are. Article 3 covers the contractor's responsibilities, uh, the obligations of the contractor uh, under the contract. Uh, in the early parts of, of Article 3, 311, uh, we deal with the legal stuff. Uh, the contractor is the person or entity defined, uh, identified as such in the agreement and is referred to throughout the contract documents as if singular in number. The contractor shall be lawfully licensed if required in the jurisdiction where the project is located. And the contractor shall designate in writing a representative who shall have express authority to bind the contract with respect to all matters under this contract. The, finally, the term contractor means the contractor or the contractor's authorized representative. And I got to admit, some of this seems almost silly, but like those farmers insurance commercials that are running on TV now, after 110 years, we've seen it all and every excuse for why I didn't have to perform that service. Next slide, please. Article 3.2 obligates the contractor to take a look at the contract documents uh, to understand why we need a little history lesson on that Spearin doctrine that Arlen alluded to uh, a, middle, a minute ago. Um, the Spearin document, doctrine uh, is based on a 1918 uh, court decision involving the federal government and a contractor doing uh, what I think was a fundamentally a defense uh, contract and uh, it held that the contractor uh, had uh, a the right to rely as Arlen said on the con construct on the contract documents that the owner provided um, 
that, that they did not have to fill in the blanks uh, for themselves. Uh, and there is an implied warranty that is associated with the contract documents. Uh, nonetheless, um, we obligate by virtue uh, of uh, Article 3.2 and actually specifically to bridge the gap uh, that the contractor uh, review the contract documents, do field measurements, and report to us uh, those kinds of inconsistencies. Inconsist this obligation appeared in the fir very first general conditions document, the, the contract that Forrest had up, the 1988 version. Next slide, please. As I said, the essence of it is review the contract documents, uh, verify in the field what needs to be verified uh, and report uh, inconsistencies to uh, the uh, owner or architect, usually the architect in that role. And that's made, that's, that language is in there so that the corrections can be made before work is commenced to avoid the cost of remedial work and protection and to provide protection against replacement cost claims. Um, understand that this is protection. It is not inoculation. We expect a good faith effort on the part of the contractor, and it's not a backstop for a lack of documentation on the part of uh, uh, we architects and our brethren. Um, next slide. Most importantly, uh, the contract document, con the contractor is not responsible for assuring that the contract documents meet all codes and standards. That is, uh, as we are all aware by virtue of our licensure, uh, the exclusive domain of the architect uh, in these situations. Next slide, please. In Article 331, we deal with supervision and construction procedures. And there are three important concepts in this provision. First is the notion of execution. The contractor has a responsibility to construct the project, uh, a notion that seems beyond the reach of some of the contractors uh, we work with, I must say, but uh, there it is. Um, they also um, uh, have the authority and the obligation to supervise and direct that work, including its subcontractors. Next slide, please. Second issue, uh, means and methods uh, phrase. Uh, the contractor uh, is, as we say, solely responsible for means and methods. As architects, we mostly describe the outcome we want to achieve, but we don't tell the contractor how to achieve that outcome. Why? Let's go to the next slide. Because the means and methods are key to establishing the liability uh, for construction. This is fundamentally risk and reward. And as Forrest mentioned uh, early on, uh, an AIA drafting principle is the notion of assigning risk uh, uh, and, and as a result reward to the party uh, best able to manage it. And in this instance, the contractor uh, is the expert in construction and safety in how to put this stuff together and is therefore best suited to manage both um, means, methods, and the risks and rewards that come from them. Um, the architect generally should not specify means and methods, and I'm sure we've all heard that, uh, but sometimes we need to in order to demonstrate a way that the work can be accomplished. Uh, my firm designed uh, a cable-supported uh, roof for the speed skating oval that was used uh, for the 2002 Winter Olympic Games here in Salt Lake City. It was a very complicated structure that had a very complicated erection sequence, and we actually spelled out for the contractor one approach that we thought would work for how to go about erecting this very complicated interactive structure. Next slide, please. Uh, that being said, Article 331 in A201 tells you that if you do specify a means and methods in your documents, but the contractor believes that to be unsafe, that is not a get out of jail free card for their responsibility for means and methods and safety. They actually are obligated to propose an alternative uh, to the architect 
that meets the design concept and achieves the level of safety uh, that the contractor uh, is comfortable with. All right, next slide, please. Moving on, Arlen uh, just mentioned that uh, under A201 uh, uh, and uh, fairly typically through our agreements, although maybe not so typical in today's construction acceleration world, the contractor is responsible for obtaining and paying for all of the general and specialized permits required to construct the work, unless noted otherwise. And you note otherwise, uh, either in your supplementary conditions, in your notice to bidders, actually we, we did not in the notice to bidders, in your supplementary conditions is, is the right place to note that. Um, and then in 373, uh, while the contractor is not a code expert, um, and this is a very important language, uh, the contract acknowledges that the contractor is not the code expert, Nonetheless, the contractor cannot build something it knows does not comply with applicable codes and regulations. And the classic example for me of this is the stair where the um, risers are of differing heights, uh, and they want to try, and they and they mess that up, and they want to blame that on your design. They cannot build things that they know and know do not comply with code. Uh, so. Um, as Arlen pointed out, uh, while the contractor is responsible for general building permits and the like, the things that are resultant of it, its activities, uh, things like uh, zoning approvals, subdivision approvals, and other uh, such things are the owner's obligation. Um, and uh, a condition of 3.73 is if, if there is a conflict or deficiency discovered by the contractor, uh, you may uh, ultimately issue a change order in order to resolve um, that uh, failure to comply with the codes. Roger. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Harlan and Forrest. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're now at section or article 374, it deals with concealed or unknown conditions that are discovered at the project site. This article outlines the procedures to follow if you encounter one of these conditions. It outlines the notification requirements and remembered what Kevin discussed back in section 1.6, that notification must be in writing. It must be documented and transmitted to the designated representative. And as somebody mentioned in a philosophy I live by as a construction administrator, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. This article also outlines the responsibilities when concealed and conditions are encountered. Uh, and this is another example of the general conditions process intended to keep the work moving by identifying a process, setting a time frame, and then allowing the contractor to proceed with the work as the problems is resolved. The process for addressing, addressing hidden and unknown conditions is an excellent example of the risk transfer principle followed by the general conditions. The risk should be assigned to the party in the best position to manage it, even if the risk is about unknowns. This, this article describes two different conditions, subsurface or concealed physical conditions, and this is important, that differ materially from those indicated in the contract documents or unknown physical conditions of an unusual nature that differ material from those that should have been expected for work in that area. A lot of discussion about concealed or unknown conditions resolved around, resolves around what's called type one or type two conditions. Type one conditions are when something is found that is different from that represented in the contract documents or information provided to the contractor and type two is unknown conditions that are represented at the site uh, in the contract documents or the information provided that is highly unusual. Both types are, well, I didn't expect that situation, but type two conditions are often harder to prove what should a reasonable contractor have known, while type one errors are pretty much straightforward. Yep, that's not what the contract documents showed. Next slide. While subsurface soil conditions are the most prevalent type of hidden conditions, 
we found just about anything and everything below and above the ground. The picture in this slide is a perfect example of, oh my, or oh no. The human remains shown, the human remains shown in this picture is a classic example of a type two hidden condition. My personal best story about unforeseen conditions involves a project in Columbia, South Carolina called Riverbank Zoo. We designed a barn to demonstrate the milking process for cows. During foundation excavation, the contractor discovered the carcass of an elephant and a rhino buried years ago. Not as problematic as human remains, but still quite a surprise and ultimately involved a change in contract sum and time. If you're involved in a project on which human remains are encountered, section 375 outlines the procedures to follow. Next slide, please. While the risk of the unknown belongs to the owner, what's the architect's role? You as the architect or your consultant must quickly investigate the conditions and make a determination if the conditions stated by the contractor falls into one of the two categories noted earlier. The tough part of evaluating a claim for hidden conditions is the requirement that the condition A be materially different from what's shown in the contract documents or information provided, type one, or if the condition is unusual to what a contractor should have known for working in that area, type two. Remember, section 321 of the general conditions, as Kevin stated earlier, that by executing the owner-contractor agreement, the contractor has reviewed the project site, become familiar with local conditions, correlated their observations with the work required in the contract documents. You as the architect are gonna be asked to evaluate what, a reasonable, what is a reasonable site review. Do you expect the contractor to do additional borings? Do you expect the contractor to lift the ceiling tile in a, rem a remodel area and look above the ceilings? or do selective demolition, or just do a walkthrough and make reasonable visual observations. After a prompt of investigation is complete, the architect must issue a written response following my philosophy that if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. If the architect determines the unforeseen condition meets one of the two criteria discussed earlier, the architect will recommend an equitable adjustment in the contract sum or contract time or both. If the architect determines the unforeseen condition was, does not meet one of the two criteria, the written response will be the contractor is not entitled to an adjustment in sum or time. Examples of this could be there's a fire hydrant visible on the site and shown on the site survey given to the contractor but no water line is shown on the survey. Would the contractor be entitled to an additional cost when they dig up the water line? If conditions, we're going to use two really important words here, materially differ from reasonable expectations and what is in the contract documents or could be reasonably inferred from the contract documents or information that might be available to the contractor outside the contract documents and may result in either an increase or decrease in the contract sum or contract time, the architect will make a recommendation for an adjustment in the contract sum or contract time. Likewise, if conditions do not materially differ from what, re what could be reasonably expected or inferred from the contract documents or other information available, the architect notifies everyone that no adjustment will be made. Lastly, as stated in this slide, if either party, owner or contractor, disputes the architect's recommendation or determination, the party may submit a claim. Next slide. Article 3.8 discusses allowances or outlines allowances. Allowances are specified amounts that the contractor includes in its contract sum to cover certain materials and or equipment whose type and or quantity may not be fixed at the time the contract sum is established or submitted. An allowance is a tool in contract to guard against uncertainty or risk. The quantity for some or all of the risk is in the allowance, not left up to chance. Allowances can be determined by the owner and the architect during the preparation of the specifications. 
The contractor includes these allowance amounts in the contract sum. Examples of some allowances are cost per square yard of carpet or include 750 cubic yards of carpet in this project. Cost per square yard of wall covering or so many square yards of wall covering. Cost, total cost for residential appliances. Allowances could be for a specific quantity of material to be included in the contract sum, such as unit cost, cost per square yard for removal and disposal of unsuitable soil, cost per for square yard for placement of offsite suitable fill, cost for removal and disposal of trench rock or mask rock. When a contractor encounters one of these materials, the cost for handling these measures has already been established. The quantities for these examples is usually determined by a pre-selected agency like a geotechnical testing company. Handling, labor, installation costs, contractor markups, and overhead and profit are already included in the contract sum and are not included in the allowance amounts. The process for handling allowance or using allowances included in the contract sum is usually described in the allowance section of the specification. In our specification, it's the front end section 012100. How many bids must a contractor obtain for the allowance? Is it a proprietary product? What happens if the lowest submitted cost exceeds the allowance amount? What happens if the cost submitted is less than the allowance amount? The final allowance cost is established by the actual expense incurred. And anything over an allowance or under an allowance is gonna be reconciled through a change order. Items to remember about allowances. The allowances can be for the contractor or the owner's use. Unused allowance amounts included in the contract sum are retained by the owner. And handling, labor, installation costs, markups, overhead and profit, are already included in the, in the price and not in the allowance amount. Next slide. Superintendent. Kevin talked about the contractor's responsibility to provide a superintendent. Next slide, please. Section 3.9 outlines the contractor's responsibility for employing a competent superintendent. The superintendent shall be present at the site at all times when work is being performed. The superintendent has the authority to bind the contractor with decisions made. The superintendent directs the work and the superintendent should be the central point of communication at the site. I've recently experienced this a lot. Some owners have the impression that one of the architect's responsibilities is to supervise the contractor. I've explained to these owners several times that they are compensating the contractor for full-time supervision of the work performed at the project site. The architect's responsibility, as we will discuss later, is to periodically observe the work, not direct or supervise the work. Architects. Please don't make the mistake of assuming the contractor's responsibilities on the job site. I think somebody said this earlier. Stay in your lane. Don't direct the work of the trades. Take it to the superintendent, and this includes relating to safety. The owner is not compensating the architect to supervise the contractor. Next slide, please. Section 310 requires the contractor to submit for the owner and architect's information a construction schedule. This schedule is a tool for all to use but belongs to the contractor. The type of construction schedule to be submitted is found in the front end of the specs. Many different schedule formats are available and if this is going to be an effective tool, the type of schedule should be appropriate for the size and complexity of the project. This section also requires the contractor to submit a submittal schedule for the architect's approval. This schedule is a tool for both contractor and architect's use. Next slide. As this slide states, 
the submittal schedule shall be coordinated with the construction schedule. You can find this requirement in section 310.2 of the general conditions. Next slide. The architect uses the submittal schedule to plan for the manpower required to review and approve submittals, which allow the contractor to procure and proceed with the work in the sequence shown in the construction schedule. If provided, the contractor can use this tool to manage submittal process and to coordinate its needs for submittal approval and product procurement. On a large complex project with hundreds of submittals, the lack of a submittal schedule can cause both architect and their consultants and the contractor negative issues. One issue is, one of those negative issues could be coordinating numerous submittals that are required in the individual spec section, best when submitted concurrently to allow complete coordination and review. Examples are kitchen equipment, coordinated with plumbing and electrical rough ends for this equipment. Masonry veneer, continuous insulation and flashings, maybe in different specification section, but should be commit, submitted concurrently to allow review. Residential appliances and casework is another example. Mechanical equipment and electrical requirements. Say the, the contractor decides to use a different Mechanic, piece of mechanical equipment then was used as the basis of design and the electrical requirements for that piece of equipment are different than what's shown on the documents. Coordination needs to be made before they install it and discover that later. My experience leads me to make the statement that the submittal schedule will be submitted less than 50% of the time. Many time contractors will submit submittal logs and not a schedule. I believe the AIA contemplated this non-submission with the language used in section 427 when it states, the architect's actions will be taken in accordance with the submittal schedule approved by the architect or in the absence of an approved submittal schedule with reasonable promptness. So you may or may not get this schedule, but it sure is helpful if you have it. As the slide states, the contractor assumes the risk of the time, the risk of the time the architect and his consultants use to review and return submittals when a submittal schedule is not submitted. And this can be found in section 310.2. Next slide, please. Construction schedule. The construction schedule is an ever evolving tool for use by everyone on the project to understand how the contractor plans to reach the end in the time allotted. This section was expanded to require the contractor to include specific information with their construction schedule and a level of detail that is appropriate for the project. As we discussed earlier, you probably don't need a CPM schedule to do a remodeling project and you wouldn't want to do a hospital using a bar chart use the correct tool for the project. What is the architect's responsibility for the construction schedule? Obtain it, review it, understand it. The architect's duty is to inform the owner when the contractor has a deviation from that schedule. As we stated earlier, this is an evolving tool which changes as the project progresses. This is a tool used to help each other in what we're all trying to achieve. We're not doing this because it's, the contract requires it. Construction process goes much more smoothly if everyone follows the process, not just because it's written down in the 201 or the specs. You as the architect need to pay attention to this on a regular basis. It is a giant mess to unwind. While the construction schedule is the contractor's tool to plan and manage the work, the architect and owner also use the schedule to gauge progress as well as evaluate claims for time extensions. Another important change to the 2017-201, previously the architect determined the delay impact and recommended adjustment to the schedule. Now the contractor must, who is really the, in the best position to analyze the impact, makes the proposal, including any supporting information that the architect requires in the specifications, and then the architect evaluates and the request and makes a recommendation. Next slide, please. Project schedule. A project schedule is used to plan the entire process for the project 
including but not limited to all the design phases, production of the construction documents, the owner's review and comment during all the design phases, review and approval by the authority having jurisdiction and other government and governing agencies, procurement, notice to proceed, construction, substantial completion, and final completion. The architect will create a simple project schedule shortly after execution of the owner architect agreement that as the progress progresses will be expanded. Many CM as advisors or program managers will create a project schedule which incorporate the schedules created by the architect and the construction schedule created by the contractor and sometimes this is referred to as a master schedule. As we stated the construction schedule for the pro is a, is a tool for the project used by all participants to navigate from start to finish. Next slide, please. Forrest. Thank you, Roger. Um, so we spent a little bit of time talking about schedule and since we're all architects, we've found ourselves a little bit behind schedule. The um, next portion of information that we're supposed to go over is shop drawings, product data, and submittals. And um, we're not going to have time to get that concluded. And then we're going to turn it back over to Roger to give us some information about the role of the architect in the project. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to tee up the uh, submittals portion and we'll dive into that in more detail in the next session. Um, just on a couple of things, we can go to the next slide, Hosty. Um, Kevin made the observation that definitions occur in different places, some in Article 1 and some um, throughout the general conditions where they're best served. And the definition of shop drawings is found in 312.1. The definition of product data is found in 312.2. And the definition of samples is found in 312.3. So those are capitalized terms within the agreement. And um, you can find those definitions there. The next article is one that I don't want to shortchange. So I want us to have some time to talk about that in the next session, but that's Article 3.12.4. And it says something that Kevin said very early on in, in the session, and that's that shot drawings, product data, samples, and similar submittals are not contract documents. So um, I think there's a lot to talk about uh, in, in contract documents. There's a lot that the architect has responsibility for in the submittal process, even though it is occurring under Article 3, which has the roles of the contractor. It, it frames it in terms that the contractor will provide submittals to the architect, the architect will take actions on them, and these are the things that can happen and the rights and responsibilities of, of each of those in that process. Um, at this point, Hostia, I want to ask if you think it's a good time to um, talk about resources and question processes. The contract documents education is recorded and placed on our learn page. Any questions that we can't get to today or any questions that you have about our content generally, you can always uh, send to docinfo at AIA.org at any time. We also uh, add all of our education, not only to our Learn page, but also to our YouTube channel. So please make sure that you uh, subscribe to our YouTube if you haven't yet. We have all sorts of great education and video series um, as well. And I'd want to like to thank our presenters uh, for taking the time to uh, provide this excellent and thorough presentation and thank our attendees. And we will see you uh, at part two. Thank you all.